opines that privilege does not actively confer power on those who wield it, but acts in a passive fashion to confer benefits on those who possess it. Such benefits are often the result of processes that are wider, deeper, and well entrenched by historical accidents in a particular society. Taking after Giddens, Kadirfailu argues that the maintenance of a system of privilege is a process of structuration. Privilege is embedded in social structures and simultaneously structures social interactions and access to infrastructure. Now, finally, the idea of privilege as policy. Now, when I talk about of privilege as policy, what I may mean here is taking after Lian, uh, Hill and Lien is on how privilege is operationalized as ideology. That is how, is how privilege is able to successfully penetrate and even dominate society without being exposed as unfair or discriminatory against non-privileged groups. How does this happen? The answer lies in invisibility. An important criterion of privilege, one that makes it so enduring, while at the same time evokes hostility from people with privilege to argue against its existence is invisibility. While it may be easy to call out racism, sexism, or homophobism, because of recorded acts and agency pointing an agency, pointing to the benefits of privilege may be harder, not just because it is passive and therefore less visible, but also because of its ability to be invisibilized. As Peggy McIntosh says, unearned benefits are often invisible or made invisible because they are unacknowledged. Does one's privilege automatically disprivilege and other? Well, because privilege is not only contextual, but also relational, it can be used to easily disprivilege the unprivileged other. Yet, this is not often realized because of the invisibility of privilege. Making the invisible visible then results in much discomfort to those with unearned privileges because they are forced to confront aspects of their status and achievements that may not necessarily really arise out of their individual efforts, but due to structural factors working in their favor. So putting together the above argument, Chinese privilege then refers to the exclusive racial advantages that position the Chinese as Singapore's cultural, economic, political, and social core, as argued by historian Hydra, Hyder's Saharuddin. So how is Chinese privilege created and made enduring in Singapore? Just like white privilege in the US has its own history, Chinese privilege too has a local history. Historian Hyder Saharuddin argues that while the British colonial rule of Singapore was premised on Anglo-Saxon supremacy and privilege, it was actually the post-colonial government under the People's Action Party that produced Chinese privilege and transformed it into an institutional, structural, and systemic phenomenon. Having purged Singapore of its communist leanings, blamed on Chinese-educated Singaporeans, the, the People's Action Party government sought to regain Chinese votes by embracing aspects of Chineseness, including Confucianism and promoting Mandarin language language, which actually was earlier demonized as the language of the communists. How were Singaporeans able to accept the privileging of one race in a country founded upon the ideologies of multiracialism and meritocracy, which were touted to reduce all groups to cultural equality and contribute to the development and maintenance of Singapore as a country where only merit counts? I argue that it's precisely the intersectionality between privilege, multiracialism, and meritocracy that enable the founding and firm entrenchment of Chinese privilege in Singapore by invisibilizing it. Let us look <clears throat> at intersectionality as a way of understanding the operation of Chinese privilege in uh, Singapore's society. In politics, so I'm going to look at three areas, politics, housing, and education. 
In politics, Chinese privilege was made enduring through a political system of governance known as the GRC or Group, Representat Group Representative Council, uh, sorry, constituency. Created in 1988, it was slated to establish minority representation in parliament where each GRC would have at least one minority, ethnic minority politician, thereby ensuring that parliament would always be multiracial. So multiracialism was promoted as, <clears throat> as the reason for the establishment of the GRC. Now, what the GRC in effect did was to ensure that the majority of parliamentarians would be permanently race Chinese. By promoting multiracialism as an erstwhile reason for the existence of the GRC, the fact that the Chinese enjoyed the privilege of perpetual power was invisibilized. Secondly, the area of housing. Chinese privilege in parliament was effectively aided by a public housing policy that imposed a racial quota to facilitate racial integration and dismantle ethnic enclaves. Created in 1989, a year after the GRC system was instituted, this policy was known as the Ethnic Integration Policy, the EIP, whereby every block of public housing in Singapore was regulated by a quota system that corresponded to the proportion of the three major race groups in the population. So 76% Chinese, 15% Malays, and 7% Indians. So this was replicated on each uh, housing, uh, public housing block in Singapore. Multiracialism and the intermingling of races was touted as the reasons for the enactment of this policy. Once again, by ensuring that the Chinese would always form the majority population in all housing estates in Singapore, they bolstered the community's voting clout and ensured that GRC politicians would appeal to Chinese interests at the expense of minority interests. Once again, such a non-democratic system privileging the majority Chinese was made invisible by pouting multiracialism. The third one is in education. <clears throat> now, this is a little different because um, in this area, it became highly visible, yeah? The discrimination became highly visible. SAP or the Special Assistance Plan schools were created in 1979 to nurture those students who excelled in both the English language as well as the race language or mother tongue. However, since its inception, only English and Chinese were taught, were taught at the first language level, essentially making these schools Chinese schools. This is because many uh, SAP schools were historically Chinese medium schools that were converted to incorporate the teaching of English in addition to that of Chinese. One reason for the establishment of these schools was to regain the confidence of the Chinese educator, many of the many of whom, who, sorry, who saw many Chinese medium schools shut down in colonial Singapore as they were seen as hotbeds of communism. While education in Singapore was the bastion of meritocracy, the presence of these well-funded elite Chinese schools, <clears throat> these schools are funded um, by the government using taxpayers' money, yeah? The presence of these well-funded elite Chinese schools went against the principle of meritocracy, which preached equality and did not privilege any race. Since top performing Chinese students gained entry into these schools, they inevitably produced an academically elite Chinese class that enjoyed the fruits of their scholastic achievements in the form of brighter opportunities for social mobility. SAP schools have been clearly criticized as a visible violator of Singapore's principle of meritocracy, but they continue to uh, exist and flourish, a testimony to blatant Chinese privilege in Singapore. Now, <clears throat> why is the notion of Chinese privilege so vehemently attacked and denied by many? I started this paper by sharing the story of my colleague, 
who harassed me for speaking on the subject of Chinese privilege. The harassment continued for a couple of days as he produced stories to show how Indians from India enjoyed privileged status in Singapore as a result of a free trade agreement between Singapore and India that was signed in 2005. Of course, none of the examples he provided showed any evidence of preferential treatment enjoyed by Indians in Singapore. Why would my educated sociology colleague, just like many others before him, become so upset by Chinese privilege? I attribute his anger to his collapsing of the three, three frames of privilege that I used. Privilege as concept, as ideology, and as policy. To give you a little bit of a background, <clears throat> my colleague hails from a working class family. His parents sold noodles in the market and raised a big family of nine children on their meager income. My colleague excelled in his studies, went to the top high school in Singapore and managed to secure a scholarship to pursue graduate studies in sociology in the United States. He therefore saw himself as a product of Singapore's meritocratic system and rejected any suggestion that ethnic privilege could have contributed to his success. While this is the tr truth, what I'm trying to show here is that his rejection of Chinese privilege points to the operation of privilege as a at a conceptual level. Furthermore, his examples on the supposed privilege enjoyed by Indians showed that multiracialism was in full force, i.e., that is, if there was a privilege, then it was enjoyed by all races. As such, to single out one race, specifically the Chinese, and attribute unearned advantages as accruing to them was something that was highly illogical and even nonsensical to him. This was privilege operating at the ideological level. The fact that despite his own upward social mobility, he failed to see Chinese privilege as an institutionalized structure, creating systemic obstructions for ethnic minorities in Singapore, showed how he failed to recognize privilege operating at the level of policy, whereby it was completely invisibilized. I wish to point out in my short presentation here that what I have attempted to show is that Chinese privilege is systemic, structural, and institutionalized, and hence goes beyond individual effects. Yet the systemic, structural, institutionalization of privilege can unfortunately create oppression at the individual level as well. In his famous article on privilege and oppression, Sociologist Alan Johnson argues how privilege does not equate to the good life or to happiness. Privilege creates oppression and participating in an oppressive system exacts huge costs on the privileged. We can see this in the example that I outlined below. In politics, one aspect of Chinese privilege that we see in the PAP government is the firm stance that only a Chinese person can become prime minister. What this means is that the person who becomes prime minister will always be settled with the nagging thought as to whether he got his post because of it is his ethnicity rather than his merit. As I quite cheekily tell my students, he'll have to keep asking himself, right? Is it because I'm Chinese? In the area of public housing, the ethnic quota policy is seen to have produced greater financial costs for ethnic minorities who are forced to sell to minority Malay or Indian buyers because of the small